Okay. Good. So I'm sorry. <laughs> oh wait, no, no I hear my sound. Uh, there's like I, I want to talk about some community matters first, and some general topics, and then about uh, some features and how they tie together for for secure uh, properties of the machine. So. There are things that don't change, and uh, people change jobs. And uh, I mean, you, you, some of you know probably, uh, but not everybody knows that uh, Leonard Pottering has moved to Microsoft. So uh, that's I mean, surprising in some ways, but also it's, in other ways not surprising because right now the system D community has uh, two full-time people from Microsoft working on upstream. Uh, a bunch of uh, Red Hat people, uh, then people from Facebook, then some, some uh, I guess that other people are not working full time, but there's also other volunteers and, and so on. So the community has spread a lot and, uh, and in some ways this is healthy. Um, so systemd is spelled systemd and if you put a capital D there at the end, you make us cry. <laughs> uh, and there's always well, work to be done. Uh, I pulled up the, the stats from today, and we have uh, well, 1,800 1, or 1,700 uh, issues, and half is bugs, half is RFEs. Um, and I will also talk about this at the end. But in general, as always, we are looking for help because um, well, there's just too many, too many things to do. Uh, in Fedora, there is 128 open issues, but that's mostly because uh, Fedora will auto close issues when for all releases. So, so we lose a bunch of uh, bugs this way. Um, there would be more, I guess. Uh, and there is well a hundred bugs that, that need to be to be triaged and looked into and so on. Mm. And we kind of keep out. Uh, Keep creating releases, um, and uh, the last five releases have been like on a well, not a regular schedule, but there's like, some variants. We would like to do it every two months. It comes out like well, you can see here, not more than half a year usually. Um, the number of commits like is fifteen hundred to two thousand commits, so, so a bit. But I'm really proud of this column here, the number of contributors. It varies, but it's, it's, it's a very healthy number. Um, we also have, apart from those main releases, we uh, do point releases like 2471, 2472, 2473 with backports. I think that we're 24712 or something like that right now. Uh, and those Point releases are the the, the way that uh, system D uh, goes into distributions. Mm. And uh, 252 is being prepared. We have just 1,000 patches, but we, we plan to make an RC release mm, <coughs> oh, soon, and then maybe in a month from now there will be another release. Uh, and well. Features have releases, uh, releases have features, but sometimes they lose features. And I want to talk about two things that are going away. So, split user is this, uh, well, there's two aspects to, to it. One is that you have um, some binaries in slash bin and slash as bin and some binaries in slash user slash bin and slash user slash as bin. Uh, and that's uh, um, I mean the, the, the location is split, but there's the other aspect is when you mount uh, the slash user subdirectory. So we have required that it's always mounted uh, for a while. So we can mount it in the NRD and then when you put into the real system, you must have both slash bin and slash user bin, otherwise things won't work. But we, the, the fact that you have the split was supported and we looked for every configuration file into places and every binary into places and so on and this is this is going away uh, in about a year so uh, I mean we, we are waiting for the uh, for Debian bookworm to uh, 
go away and then we remove this functionality. So, I mean, it doesn't matter for, for people from Fedora or RHEL, but it matters from, for people from uh, Debian and Gentoo and maybe some other uh, projects. And another interesting one is Cgroups v1. We want to drop support <coughs> for uh, the old Cgroup hierarchy. Uh, RHEL 8 used v1 by default and v2 optionally. RHEL 9 uses v2 by default and v1 optionally. And well, if we drop it up upstream, then who knows what will happen in, in RHEL 10. But uh, this, this code is, is very, I mean, the, the v1 code can be, is very complicated and we would not like to, to, to just get rid of it to simplify our life. Um, so those are features that are being removed and now let's talk about features. So there's this uh, something called credential mechanism in system D and uh, initially this was used for, for, the idea was that for example you have a, a certificate for TLS for the web server and uh, this will be handled as a credential or, or some, some, some key material, passwords, stuff like that. So it has the name. But now it's used for configuration and other stuff, so, so the name is kind of obsolete, so don't get confused by it. So, so we have some, some data, and uh, instead of passing it directly to, to, to a, putting it in a known location of disk, we kind of abstract this. We take, take it, put it in a file, but in a, like a shared directory, uh, and or some other place, which I'll talk about later. And then we configure the, the unit file for the service to say that it should, uh, it needs the credential called data or some other name. And then the manager uh, looks in this shared directory or some other places and passes the credential to the service. And the, the service gets a, an environment variable that tells it where to look and opens <coughs> a file or something that looks like a file there. Uh, well, I mean, it's, this sounds not useful on its own, and it's not useful on its own, but we, this is, the, the generic me mechanism is extended in various ways. So, in particular, particular this, this storage part is that you can put things in a file, but you can, for example, create a pipe, uh, and then the manager will connect to this pipe, a, like a unique socket, uh, uh, push the name of the, the um, credential to be delivered and then something else from the other end must deliver this credential. So for example, you can implement a service that would pull credentials uh, over the network or from somewhere else. There's a mechanism to take credentials and pass them through layers. So for example, it was if, we, if we have virtualization, we could have a um, credential the, on the host and then the host manager takes this credential and passes it to the container manager service. The container manager service takes the credential and passes it to the, to the container, and the container in the container, the container uh, system D takes the credential and passes it to the unit, and then the unit, unit makes use of it. So, uh, I mean, data is being passed around. Um, and there's like support for doing this for the uh, virtual machine boundary between the host and the, 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 the virtual machine via some uh, QMOs, uh, firmware stuff. You can also pass credentials on the command line and you can also, at the bootloader can pass credentials to the running system. So there's like a plenty different mechanisms, but in the end for the service, it doesn't matter. It gets I mean, this is all abstracted away by, by, by the manager. And then this file uh, it is not stored on disk, it's stored in memory. And uh, ideally, it's actually stored on memory that is not even swappable. So it's not tempfs, it's uh, ramfs. Uh, so that, uh, well, you, you, once you reboot the machine, the, the, the this data is completely gone in this form. Now, um, this is useful if the, the, this data is stored uh, encrypted. So we kind of complicate this previous picture. We have some data, we encrypt it, we put it in storage as before, and then here the manager takes care of decrypting the, the blob before passing it to the service. 
And um, uh, this encryption is not, well, it's, it's done in two ways. Uh, it can be encrypted via, uh, with, with, with a key that is stored in a file on the system. Uh, so, uh, this uh, basically, this means that you need, with, I mean, if, you, if you lose this file, then all the credentials become un un undecryptable. But that's not so useful, it's used kind of as a fallback. Uh, and then we also encrypt the credentials with uh, TPM. So this means that you can uh, take a, uh, I don't know, like this, this certificate, store it on the machine, and if you take the disk out of the machine, you cannot uh, decrypt this copy. Uh, so this provides pretty nice security features. Um, so the, like this upper path is mostly for to, to, to provide support for systems which don't have TPMs, and um, by default, they, 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 both both files are needed. So um, we, we try to make it. Uh, I mean, as secure as possible given specific hardware. Um, and uh, this, this credential mechanism is integrated in units in various ways. So uh, you can start units only if you have credential, you can uh, mm, pass uh, credentials, uh, use credentials to configure certain services. So if, for example, you can uh, system this is user service which runs during early boot will look for certain credentials and create users uh, and the temp file service will also create I and mean, use use credentials as configuration so this mechanism in particular allows you to to create users and files on disk with arbitrary contents based on well data that is stored some externally uh, outside of the machine and um, right, I mean the, the, the common theme here is that we um, try to make use of the um, hardware features of the, the, that are supposed to provide security. Uh, so you can bind uh, arbitrary credential data to um, to the local machine uh, when you uh, have. If a file system encrypted with LUX, uh, it can also be bound to uh, the TPM. Uh, this makes, in a way, um, Linux behave more like Windows because you can suddenly say that, well, the disk is encrypted, but uh, if you are booting a specific uh, system, then you can open up the disk without, I mean, decrypt the disk without type it in the full password, but using something that is stored in the, uh, in the DPM. And um, system D is, uh, we, I mean, to, to actually make use of those those things, you need to measure things. Uh, so, so for example, like the, 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 uh, the kernel, the, um, the interd that you are putting and other, the, the configuration into PCR. So that those measurements are then used for policies to uh, build uh, decryption policies or data access policies, and uh, systemd has been growing. Uh, I mean, doing more measurements so so that you can make this more useful. Um, and uh, there's a nice tool that kind of helps with this. Uh, it's <coughs> called systemd measure uh, and it will be new in uh, version 252. So basically. Uh, you say, okay, if I have a specific kernel binary with a specific initRD and a specific set of uh, configuration files, because this all matters, then uh, after uh, this machine is booted, we expect that the SHA-512 PCR uh, number 11 will have some, some value. And then we can, for example, say that uh, if uh, PCR11 has this, this value, then we uh, allow access to certain passwords or certain certificates or something like that without uh, uh, additional um, verification. Mm -hmm. So, 
So we have those those features um, for, for 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 data access, but uh, to, to actually make use of this, we, we need to rework how uh, how the machine boots, how also how interds are built, uh, and. Uh, I just want to talk about some 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 general concept, not, not about implementation details. So, right now, we kind of build the interd based on files on disk, and we want to move towards taking RPMs and uh, so using pristine files that are, that haven't been haven't gone for the for the local file system and possibly have been modified in any way. Um, and also to stop doing modifications, we, we want to reuse the binaries that are used in the real system in the ERD without local tweaks. Uh, and then once we have that, we can kind of move towards using generic ERD. So everybody has the same ERD, uh, but this is blocked by by the requirement to have local configuration. Right? I mean, if everybody has the same ERD. Then how do you specify uh, the, the 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 name of the root partition? So we we have we need local configuration, and this local configuration can be passed through the credential mechanism, uh, and uh, doing it this way allows us to, for example, say that the the the, the, um, uh, the local configuration must must be signed and must be bound to the local machine. So. This is like the well semi long term plan. The long term plan is to, to move building of initiatives into the central build system. So right now we, we build a kernel, we build kernel modules, we sign the kernel and sign the kernel modules, put them in packages. But uh, once we start doing this with the initiatives, uh, we, we build them centrally, we save time on the local machines, uh, we, we can sign the um, initiatives like, just like we signed the kernel. And then, once we have that, we can verify the interdees using the same uh, key that is the keys are, that are used to uh, check that the kernel that is being booted has been signed. Um, and uh, there's there's a tool that implements this. I will not not that works towards this, uh, and it's kind of like a. a uh, something that kind of replaces Dracut, but we I'm not trying to say that Dracut will be replaced. It's, it's another attempt at things. It's called MKOSI interd. So it builds uh, interd images from RPMs. There is a link if you if you want to take a look. Um, and uh, so I mean I think this is all pretty interesting. It's also not entirely clear where, where all of this will go. Because we have, like with the PCRs, we, we do some measurements, but <coughs> which measurements will be useful, what things should be should be added, this is this hasn't really been decided yet, nobody knows for, for sure. Um, and uh, systemd upstream is a nice place to get involved. We have lots of uh, external contributors. Uh, systemd in Fedora also needs help. Um, and uh, New features need to be added to MKSI in TRD and also to Trackwood. Uh, so, I mean, just, those are all places that, that are looking for contributors. And, I don't know, questions? So, right now, if you enable Secure Good on Fedora, it's not verifying in it RD, or is it yes. the way that we it's use this shim? Shim layer to like so so uh, verify it locally. So the shim layer um, is generally used so that you um, uh, Microsoft holds the, this 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 key that is used to sign shim and shim changes relatively. So they they, they do, do it like every well less than once a year, uh, and then uh, shim uh, is used to to uh, sign. Uh, keys for for the um, for the kernels, and this gives us like a, a way to to change the kernels faster without getting Microsoft involved. Uh, but in general, only the kernel and the modules are being verified, not the interd. And of course, it's very easy to replace the interd. So this is this is very leaky. Now, this is with the 
like the pre-installed kits. You can do local builds and sign them locally and do local enrollment of whatever keys you want. And then this all doesn't matter because you, you, you can sign your init ID locally. But like the, um, the usual path is that the init ID, and the kernel is signed by the, by, by, transitively by the pre-installed Microsoft key and the init ID is not verified. In short, like uh, if you are using secure boot and you also have encrypted whole root and you think you are safe, you are not because you still have boot partition which is always unencrypted and there is the entirety which is started and it's not verified at all. So basically, anyone can pull up your hard drive, replace your entirety with something else, and yeah. That's when. So basically, the secure boot, the UEFI verifies the shim layer, right? Because okay. that's signed by Microsoft. And then the shim verifies the kernel. Why? So, so we sign the kernel in Koji. Why cannot? Why is not I the take the same thing? It's built locally on your machine, and you don't have the, the signing key. Yeah, why? Why do I don't have it? Because it's protected in a vault <coughs> or in Red Hat infrastructure, and nobody can access it. Right? Okay. I mean, we we cannot. So even for Fedora, you this would is have to replace the keys with your own keys to, to sign it locally. Yeah, yeah. I'll be behind you. That's a uh, thing about that in a Trum FL or in Tati is stored at an unencrypted boot partition. Technically, that's a, boot, a, boot, a bootloader thing. You technically can have a bootloader which supports encryption. I don't know if that's the use. I don't know. But I know that uh, there was a proposal of uh, packing curl in it already and uh, curl uh, parameters into one file which would be signed and that would be verified and if the verification failed the system would refuse booting so yes uh, so this is called uh, unified kernels mm -hmm. and uh, that we want to do that but you can only do that if you have the interd at the time where you are combining those things so if the interds are built in koji along with the, I mean, after the kernel then we can you can put them together and sign this but uh, I mean, you, you cannot do the signature before you have the uh, uh, interd, and encrypt uh, uh, to the first part. Encryption of the full disk gives you some protection. I mean, it doesn't give you it doesn't protect against everything, but it actually I mean it gives you very good properties. Not well, I don't know. Uh, so. Uh, I don't want to say that this is, I mean, this is not something that we usually use, but it's uh, also a useful approach. But, okay, sorry. And, and actually, this is what cloud vendors are pushing heavily yes. now, because this is unsolved problem, like encryption of in, uh, signatures on init RDs. So they are sort of sidestepping this problem by trying to push people to have everything encrypted, including boot, and they propose, Microsoft proposed a set of patches to grab to grab to, I mean, to to essentially do lux uh, decryption in, in grab. But for example, this pushes a lot of responsibility onto the bootloader and uh, I don't know, like if you want to have, okay, if you have just this one, one password that you type in, that's okay, but what if you, I don't know, want to have like some boot recovery and stuff, adding all that logic into the uh, bootloader is complicated. We want to keep it in the user space. So. Yeah, so first one addition to the uh, boot encryption. Basically how we now see the full disk encryption in Linux is that it only protects your data. <coughs> so if you ever lose the system, and recover it afterwards, you cannot use it again because it can be corrupted basically because the is uh, is not encrypted. So if this happens, you need to wipe the data and start over. So that's how full encryption, the full, full disk encryption now works in Linux, without protecting you uh, only about some problems. And my question about the init RD was, yeah, if you generate init RD in Koji and sign it, that's okay, but uh, if you allow them adding some configuration, I assume using init RD overlay, then you have the problem with the init RD overlay. You can still, uh, the attacker still can do that and that cannot be signed. So how do you protect about this? Um, 
Yes. Um, I think we spoke about it once, and one of the possible solutions is actually limit what's in the overlay in Itagi to make sure that it's only configuration files that you can't include any binaries or basically any code that can be started. But yeah, that's a tough question. Now. Like, ideally, the machine should be configured in a way that you don't need any configuration. Like, for example, on laptop, I think it's possible. Like, if you use, well, if you set up your partition correctly, they have or the correct neighbors, then you don't need any configuration for the unit ID. So one thing that you can certainly do is you can um, uh, also build uh, extensions. Like for example, you want to have a generic initrd, but you also want to have an initrd with sshd and networking. So um, we have a mechanism to to combine those like to, to additions to the, the initrd, and those additions would also could also be built centrally and also signed in the same way as the initrd and then the uh, the bootloader would verify the initrd and in, in the initrd uh, system d would verify those extensions before using them uh, so so for code actually there is uh, i mean it's not fully implemented but but like the, the conceptually it's it's known what to do but for the configuration well at least what what, what happens is that you can buy, um decryption of the data to the configuration measurements so that uh, if somebody changes their configuration that it, then it won't decrypt the, your data uh, it uh, so the machine will generally not work which is probably better than it booting and working but yeah it's uh, I, I mean verifying that the configuration is as you wanted it Without some external entity that assesses uh, is well hard. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I actually have a question about the uh, credential store. So, who would be target user for the? Well, uh, so there's a couple of uses. Like you, you have uh, I know TLS certificates. That this is like an obvious use. Uh, we want to. Uh, allow users to log in for recovery using user passwords in the interd when something when you cannot put the machine uh, but we don't want to take those uh, passwords from the disk which is probably encrypted and put them in slash boot unencrypted but if we encrypt them using this way then they are pretty safe um, also like for, for configuration um, root partition stuff and maybe like uh, network configuration for machines that need network uh, root FS. And the, the, the mechanism is general. I think that other users will pop up too. Okay. I'm not sure about that, isn't it used by Podman these days? Because I think the original request for this feature actually came from like our container team that they wanted to pass something into our well, containers run by Podman. But I, I don't know if it's now, but, but I don't I know. know. That, that was where the original idea came from. Oh, I was actually thinking that Kubernetes could actually use it because it, it has like form of secrets. They are stored in, in the file system. So like this could be a good mechanism to encrypt them and only make them <coughs> available for like certain pods. Okay, so thank you. And I think we are all of time.